class, and we just got into a phase here where we were uh, talking about not seeing things in what we were calling a classical level according to religion or just the way that uh, the nominal seeing of things, but as in quantum physics going deeper. And, um, but we were also saying that sometimes you can see something from the Lord and when you see that, you start getting dogmatic. Now, maybe you don't know what that means. That just means hard-headed. No, no. How about fixated or um, <clears throat> rigid? Uh, and here's the way that you get rigid. You know you've seen something from the Lord. It came from God. It is from God. And, and uh, we were just saying, <clears throat> we were going down a list of things that might help you in these situations not to get so uh, hard uh, to be moved, and here's why. Because there is so much more of the Lord than what we know. And that was our first one, we don't know everything. So let's make that, let's make that personal. You don't know everything, <laughs> okay. And what that means is, is that we are open to the Lord and that we uh, may know some things. To say that you don't know everything doesn't mean you don't know some things. But knowing certain things should not separate you from other people because they may have different terminology or something else and be saying the same thing and you don't get it. Uh, so the first one we said was we do not know everything. The second one is is that even a particular truth that you know can be seen from many different angles. It's like a diamond that has many different facets. Um, and, and so what happens is we see something. For example, you see a diamond and you see it from this particular angle and you no, you've seen it from the Lord, and you cannot accept somebody else's angle because you have, you have uh, believed that your angle is the only view. Okay. No, that doesn't mean your view is incorrect. Okay. So, so let's try to be balanced. It doesn't mean your view is incorrect. It also doesn't mean your view is the view. You see, that's balanced then. But we say, well, my view is correct, therefore it's the only view, or it's the only correct view of this subject, and you're going to have trouble, and you're going to be divided, and there's going to be certain people you won't fellowship with because they don't see it just like you do. And some people get so strict, stringent on this that you have to say it the way they say it. I mean, the terminology has become God. Well, I'm sorry. There is, you know, first of all, I don't believe that anybody can adequately put Jesus into words. The best thing to do is for us to come to a revelation of him, an unveiling of him. And... But with all that we see of the Lord, just realize that God is so intricate that there, there could be so many more ways of doing something. Yes. That's so right. That's me another, yeah, the uh, different facets of the diamond. That's why I always call it the living word because it's easy. Uh, I go, as he works in me, and then shows me another aspect of what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that thought came to my mind, and then I forgot. 
drive when you said it. But um, boy, it's happened to me over and over again where I would see something in the scriptures and then later on God would give me a completely different view of that and I go, whoa. And <clears throat> here's even a fact. God can show you something using a scripture that is really not saying that. <laughs> now, you know, you say, well, why would he pervert the scriptures? He's not. His goal isn't to be scriptural, okay? He's the living word, okay? I didn't say he's the living Bible. What is it? The, but the, he's the living word. <clears throat> and um, I, he's done that with me many a time where I s would see something and then and I mean, I'd really see the Lord in it, and then he would, it would be sort of like this. Now, this didn't happen, but it would be almost like my father would say, well, son, I couldn't really tell you this straight up, so I had to use this scripture that it really doesn't apply to, but at least you finally saw it. And uh, now do me a favor and try to see it in the scriptures where it really is there when you share it with other people. You know, <laughs> in other words, don't... don't uh, don't share from that same scripture that truth or if you do say well look i know this isn't what it meant but the holy spirit was still able to get past my dense head and show me the meaning and i've had to do that before all right and then um and then our third one was that we even if we have learned something from god what we have learned is not god it's from God. It may be about God, but it's not God itself. But we, listen to me, we treat it like it's God. Okay. Well, maybe I can explain that more as we get down here just a few more. Dogma, yeah. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> so along with that, I wrote down, God does not need someone to stand up for him. Now, I know that Christians, and especially um, Crusaders, I'm not talking about in your, uh, centuries past, I'm talking about today's Crusaders, um, they feel like they've got to stand up for God. You know, it, it's sort of like when we go to Arkansas, and what was it, not this last time, but a year ago when I preached, I said some things in, in jest, teasing Brother Lumen. And a few people felt like they need to come to me and stand up for Brother Lumen. And I said to them, I laughed, I, I sort of giggled, and I said, now, I said, I appreciate what you're saying, but do you really think you need to stand up for him because he can't stand up for himself? I mean, do you think that if I said something that offended him, that he wouldn't either right there publicly, which he usually does people, but he wouldn't do me, but he would most people. But he definitely would, would well, I can't even say that with me, but he might call me aside and say something. Me knowing that, I get to say whatever I want to because we'll, we'll talk about it. If it really offended him, then I didn't mean to offend him. That's not my spirit. But um, it, it was funny. Uh, they've been doing this, uh, this thing this year where they've got a, it's sort of like a TV station online. <clears throat> and so they were filming, they had two video cameras. One is just a videotape to make DVDs and whatever. And the other one was a live class going out to people watching it, you know, I guess all over the world, a bunch of different places. And so <clears throat> Janie's on piano and I'm up there on bass. And uh, so they start the thing and Brother Lemon's walking down to walk up in front of the thing, you know, to say his, you know, to start that particular service and everything. And, and uh, he's standing at the back <clears throat> and, and I said to him, or I said to the crowd, I said, you know, um, if we're going to be on TV, you know, Johnny Carson had his theme music and, 
And uh, Brother Lumen needs his theme music too. So he starts down the aisle towards the front. And as he does, I start going, dun, 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 dun. This is all going on the, the, the film. And, every, and everybody cracks up. And of course, you know, most of those people, they're going, how does she get away with this? <clears throat> Anyway, I'm, I'm straying from my subject, but my subject is this. God, do you think J.W.? God doesn't need anybody to stand up for him. He, he's going to be okay. <laughs> All right. So, along with that, just because somebody says something, and maybe it's wrong, or it's against what you believe, or it's against God, just because somebody says that, get ready, um, it doesn't void out the truth that you know or that is. If that truth is, are you following me? If that truth is, then it is. Them thinking differently or saying something different to you doesn't change anything. You know, you can get all offended and huffy and go, well, uh -uh. You know, that's how childish is that? But I mean, that, we do that. You know, that, that ain't right. You know, well, they haven't changed anything. You know, and you arguing with them or telling them they're an idiot isn't going to change them either. Especially if they, and I'm just saying it like this, especially if they are an idiot, calling them an idiot isn't going to change them. Okay? And them saying something that you don't believe or you don't like doesn't change the truth, all right? And then the second one is it doesn't change God. <laughs> People can believe, you know, um, I know several years ago, was really, really going through a hard time and a bunch of people were saying bad stuff about me and they still do. But uh, somebody came to me and said, uh, so-and-so is spreading all kind of rumors and saying bad stuff about you. And they're like, you know, they didn't say this, but it's sort of like, what are you going to do about it? You know? And I said, that's all right. You know, it's a free country. People can say what they want. I mean, you know, this is America. <laughs> well, see, now, we, we want to stand up for freedom of speech, freedom of, you know, uh, not cutting stuff out of newspapers or whatever, right? We, you know, oh, we, it's, it's our right. But if somebody says something about us, forget the Fifth Amendment or whatever, you know what I mean? Whatever, which, what is the, you know, forget that. It, it, First Amendment, that's, a, that's exactly right. Forget that. Because that affects me. And I don't want people to have freedom of speech when it affects me. You know, I'm an American. I believe in it. I mean, I, I believe in Jesus and everything, but God put me in this country and it says be true to the king and da 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 da. And so we got freedom of speech and I'm happy for it. I'm happy when I get to go down here on the street and preach Christ. I'm happy when I get to, you know, go in places that, that normally you wouldn't be able to, to preach Christ. But I'm unhappy about it when, are you following what I'm saying? No. It's a free country. Thank God they, they should be so thankful they're born in America. And that I'm an American. You have freedom of speech. Say what you want. Doesn't change God. Doesn't change me. Doesn't change the truth. <laughs> So, you know, and I'm saying all this because you're going to be confronted with this kind of stuff. Okay? Somebody's going to say something about you or something that you believe, and you're going to want to defend it when, in reality, what's the point? You know, in fact, did you know that there is a lot of scriptures in the New Testament that talks about not getting into arguments and questions and all this kind of stuff? Did you know that? A lot, yes noticing that in my weakness the Lord's been showing me more of the word in a different way and he gave me the word it says 
God is not a man that he should lie, nor, no, nor the son of man that he should repent. And that's really big for me because then I am not offended. Right. But I know, because I know that I say, no longer is it I that live, but Christ that lives in me. So I'm going to say that, right. but then think that my God Almighty, the Most High God, is a lie. No, it says, God is not a man that he should lie. So that's where my trust is. And that's a building block for faith. That I take a stand in that and I say, God is not a man that my Most High God, the one that I rely on, the one that I have been crucified with, he should not lie. That's, that's it. And boy, you talk about an anchor for your soul. I mean, for your soul, because it's your soul, not your spirit, that's freaking out. An anchor for your soul, it's a, it is. And, and that's, that's the deal. I mean, <clears throat> people saying stuff doesn't upset God's reality. You know, God's reality is eternal. God's reality, and, and you know, Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. He didn't say, Father, get them. They're a bunch of idiots, meaning idiot being they don't know what they're doing. Do you understand? He didn't say that. He said, forgive him. And, um, <clears throat> and then finally, just, just this. Um, just because it sounds weird to you should not necessarily be the point of rejection. Uh, Maybe, and this is, just listen to my words carefully, because I'm being careful in my words. Maybe there's something to it. Maybe there's not. But maybe there's something to it. So how do you find out? Do you accept what they say? No. Do you reject what they say? No. What do you do? What's the word? You ponder. You ponder, which is, you know, ultimate. But, I mean, you ponder like Mary, you know. I mean, Angel of the Lord came, showed up to mother to Mary and said, Well, you're gonna have a baby, but it won't be by husband, it's gonna be by God, and you know, da 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 da. And the Bible said, similar to what you were saying, Kim, be it unto me according to thy word. Well, dang, brothers and sisters, that's good. Because that word, he says, Thy word is forever settled in heaven. The Bible says he's exalted his word above his name. In the name of Jesus. Well, the word is exalted above his name. You know. And so, uh, and then what did it say? She pondered these things in her heart. It's like the example I always use is it's like a, a cow chewing the cud. Just chewing on it. You ever seen a cow do that? It's amazing how long they can chew one little deal, you know. But I mean, they got to because they're standing eating all day. I mean, just all day, you know. So they need to chew for a while, or they're going to be really big old fat things. You know? So chew on it. Chew on it. Don't be so quick to spit it out, and don't be so quick to swallow it. Ponder it in your heart. And, and I've, I've done this many a time. Folks, you know, I used to think that I was really something. I mean, I loved the Lord, and I was after the Lord, but, you know, I mean, I thought because God had showed me certain things and whatever, I was really something. And then, I, you know, then as I really began to know the Lord, I realized this has nothing to do with me. I'm not something. This is Jesus. God is you, Father, you are revealing your son in me, not me. I'm no different than anybody else. And, and so I learned to begin to just ponder things because I would hear things and I'd go, well, I never heard that before. You know, and you'll get that a lot from people. You will get that a lot. People will say, you'll share the cross, or you'll share you're in Christ, or you'll share something. And you know what they'll say to you? Well, I've never heard that before. And, and meaning, well, since I never heard it before, it couldn't be true, because why aren't we all hearing it? Well, but I never heard that before. And my, you know, my thought is, do you know everything? You know, I mean, do you really know everything? And are you saying to me that you know everything so well that you can tell immediately? Or is there a place? And, and you know, if I see that in someone else, I know 
See, I don't, here's the deal. Here's, here's a little process that goes off in my being. Somebody says, um, well, I've never heard that before, implying, well, then it can't be true because I never heard it before. So my processes run along the line of, okay, well, so since you know everything, there's no way that this could be true because you never heard this, right? But I know that's not true because we don't know everything. And then, at that point, you have a choice. You can attack them or you can attack yourself. You understand what I mean when I say attack yourself? I don't mean in a vicious mean, I mean, I mean, buddy, do you know everything? You don't know everything either. So why don't we, you can't fix them, you can't change them, you don't have power over anybody but you, and instead of condemning them because they come across with that, forget about them, say thank you Jesus for using that person, turn it here and say, Father, please work on me so that I don't say this to people, I just wanna have a heart that is pliable and ready, and, to, and if it's you speaking to me that I'm not so hard-headed that I immediately reject anything that, uh, that I've never heard before. See, that's one of those things, if I was in Bible school, I'd pray about right now. I'd just go, oh, Father, work that in me. I really want you to have that way in me. Yes, hand up. And I'm into gardening, so, but I was just thinking if words were like seeds, which they are when they come from the Lord, mm -hmm. even from anybody in the body, then if they really are life, they'll eventually spring forth. If, you're, if your ground is broken, like your heart is open. And if it's not a seed from the Lord, it's just gonna, it'll never bring forth. It will never sprout and grow because, mm -hmm. you know, but if you hold it there, the Holy Spirit can make it grow just like he did in Mary. Mm -hmm. And Jesus will come from it. But if it's not, then the wind will just carry it out in time. Right. <clears throat> All right, so how we got into all of this is we were, we're, we're, we're not studying physics. We're seeking the Lord, but we're using physics as a, as a jumping off board. And we, in the last class, we're looking at the difference between classical physics and quantum physics. And classical physics deals pretty much with what you can see, if you can see that. In other words, the astral world to the furthest reaches if you had a telescope or something, you understand what I'm saying, that you could see with the natural eye with the assistance of that, or if you were there, you could see it with the natural eye. Classical physics deals with those realms. Quantum physics deals with things so small, not just, you know, not just paramecium. Paramecium, what, you know, that's a one cell F, okay. Uh, paramecium, walks on a platform of subatomic particles. It looks solid to him. I mean, it, you know. And then you go further down and further down until you get to particles that you, you could never ever see. And so we were talking about the fact that in Christianity, there's classical Christianity with all that you can see and comprehend, but God wants to take us deeper. God wants to take us beyond what we can see into what he sees. And all of this that I'm saying has no more intent than to soften our hearts to say, Lord, I want to know you beyond what I know you right now. Please, Lord. Draw me and I will run. That's, that's the basis of what we're running on here. And, and nobody can bring you to a revelation in Christ. No class can do that, but something in class God can use to touch your heart to get you, because when the heart turns to the Lord, not mine, when my heart turns to the Lord, I see. When yours turns to the Lord, you see. But I can't turn your heart, only you can do that and these are elements that are given to you that if you keep praying, you keep seeking the Lord, and you keep hearing, you will say, Father, I want to know you, Jesus. I want to know you. And you will develop a heart condition that never stops. Do you know how many Christians go for a while red hot, and then eventually they just go back to the way they were before? Or, you know, just become nominal? 
just develop a heart that stays after God. You don't have to be up and down. This doesn't have to be a roller coaster. You, you can level out. Can you believe that? Yes. You can level out. Okay, see, we got a roller coaster going on right over here. It's just, you know, that's proof that God is speaking to us here. <laughs> All right. Um, but one of the things we said is that, let's see, I had a... Uh, statement I wrote. The microscopic world is not just a scaled down version of the seen world. The microscopic world, the subatomic world, the world of quantum physics is not just a scaled down version. And what we discovered is that in this world everything is order. You know, the, 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 the earth going around a certain amount of rotations and going around the sun orbiting a certain amount of, and everything you can set your clock to it. It's all so orderly but in the quantum world, it's all very unordered, disordered. Uh, it, uh, I have heard it called by physics, physicists, chaotic. All right. Um, but what if the subatomic world is not confusing at all, it's just different? It appears... Uh, um, and again, we're talking about Jesus here. <laughs> it appears confusing. It appears disordered to physicists as they study it compared to astrophysics and the, and the world of the seen. But when you get down to the core, I mean, remember, for those of you who started, when they, we started this class, we were trying to get down to the smallest particle upon which everything is built. And that meant we're trying to know what is the prime thing to God upon which everything else is built. Not, I, I just read a brochure in my office before I came out here. It's great. I, uh, oh my, my door's probably, would you open my drawer in my office? I just would have to read that to you. It's the one right, the, the, yeah, and it's uh, on the left-hand side, shoved up a little bit, and it's about a prayer seminar thing. I was, it's just too good that I can't, and it's old, old, old. It's been in there forever, but I just have to, have to show you that. But we were trying to discover what is the prime thing, and uh, some people say, well, you know, the family, uh, focus on the family. The family is the most important thing. And other people say uh, evangelism is the most important thing. And, and somebody else says, you know, taking care of our children is the most important thing. And, and prayer is the most important thing. And on and on and on. I mean, there's a million subjects. And there are a million particles. And there are a million levels where you go from, from body to organs to to cells, to molecules, to uh, atoms, to subatomic particles, uh, quarks and gluons, you know, on down. You see what I mean? And they're all breaking down to the smallest particle upon, that is the foundation upon which everything is built. Do you, see, do you kind of see where I'm going with that? To, in the Lord, we don't want to be sidetracked. We want the truth, and we want to see that, that central point, that central thing. She's avoiding the camera, so it's taking a little longer here. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. All right. This... Um, See if I can find the thing where they said that. All right. Well, let me just read this one part. Okay. You can see this right here. This is really, it's got this little statement right here, and then it's got all these things that, that it's going to teach in this seminar. Okay. A view of the supernatural power of prayer. It's all about prayer. Prayer, prayer, prayer is the answer. And I, I, I didn't see it right off the hand, but it just literally says, prayer is the chief thing. 
whatever else, this is the most important thing, okay? That means this is the particle upon which all is built, and they believe it, and they have certain scriptures that they're trying to base it on. But listen, a vision of the supernatural power of prayer, biblical structure for daily walk with God, what is prayer, who can pray, 14 obstacles to answer prayer, how to walk with God in prayer, to whom do we pray, why should we pray, when should we pray, okay. All right, now this is all in this seminar that if you'll go to, you'll learn. Now listen, you see all that written there, but you see this little paragraph right here beside it that you can't get away from? I'm going to read that. The greatest thing anyone can do for God and man is pray. Okay, this is where it was said. It is not the only thing, but it is the chief thing. This is the central point. This is the thing upon, that's what they're saying. This is the thing upon which everything else is built. Okay, well, we've already dealt in this thing past that. There are 12 foundations in the New Jerusalem, and you keep going deeper until Christ is the chief foundation. But anyway, um, it, but it is the chief thing. The great people of the earth today, the great people of the earth today are the people who pray. You know, only, what is it, only the rich have knowledge? What does that sign say over there? The only the, only the educated are free. That's written on the back of the UNT sign over there. You know, if this was the 60s, that place would have been, that sign would have been bombed and I'm, t but anyway, <clears throat> sorry, sorry. A little, uh, okay, the great people of the earth today are people who pray. I do not mean those who talk about prayer, get ready, nor those who say they believe in prayer, nor yet those who can explain about prayer. But I mean those who take time to pray. The eight-hour seminar covers. <laughs> yeah, those who explain about, it's all, it's not, they don't, they don't even pray. I'm sure they go, oh, Lord, bless you know, but it's contradicting everything that it just said. So in reality, they don't believe that prayer is the chief thing. They believe teaching is the chief thing. Am I right or wrong? I mean, see, I, I'm always trying to break things down to the truth and to the smallest thing. You know, I'm a physicist. I'm a, you know, I'm a biologist. I'm all of these that are always trying to find, and they're all, and, and you know, that's, Everything from study in space, well, where did we come from? Where did we start? What is the starting point? Da 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 da. Right down to the oceans, well, where did we come from? Archaeologists, well, where did we come from? It's all seeking the truth, just like in physics, of the, you get it right down to the primary thing. What is the primary thing? And now we know what they think, but we want to know from the Lord what it is. All right, so. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I wrote this, but what if the subatomic world was not confusing, just different? The world we know and understand and feel secure in, meaning everything of Christianity that we know and feel secure in, we figure out how something works, astrophysics, the movement of the sun, the earth, the planets, we figure out how it works. In other words, we figure out what's decently and in order. We figure out the pattern. That's classical Christianity. Uh, it becomes principle to us. The sun always, you know, the, comes up at this da-da-da-da, the earth always whatever. And it becomes principle to us. Uh, such as the lamb always lays down its life. classical view. It's okay. God ordered these things in the, in the world of the sight, but we want to discover things to their core. All right? Uh, we live by what we know, even if those principles came from the Lord, and therefore we're, this is, you know, this came from the Lord, so this is what I'm going to live by. Okay? Sounds all good. Israel learned the laws of God. Right? The priest consulted the Word of God. The Word of God was stable, right? The order of Judaism was from God, right? The order that they set up, their whole, where they camped, 
how they lived, what day they did what on. Am I right or wrong? We're talking about classical view. We're talking about ordering things according to patterns, all right, and principles. And there's nothing wrong with that. We're saying that the quantum world looks chaotic to this, this approach. The quant and, and physicists think the quantum world is chaotic. They don't get it. It looks disordered. Christians who don't know, who don't go much deeper, don't understand because they do learn things from God and they, they make it a principle in their life and there's nothing wrong with them. But there is obviously something wrong somewhere because there are, as you go deeper, there are things that we don't understand that seem unordered. All right. And again, I'm not putting that down. I'm showing you a pattern here. The priests consulted the words. The order of Judaism was from God, and their generations were ordered by it. Did God do that? Yes. Okay. Um, let's go to Exodus 28. Gosh, look at the time. Of course, I got a little while yet. Exodus 28. That's going to be page 106. Exodus 28, and verse, starting with verse 15. And we're going to read a little bit here. Um, and I'm going to read fast. But I'm going to tell you that what this is describing is the high priest's garment. Okay? All right. And thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with skillful work after the work of the ephod, that thou shalt make it of gold, of blue, of purple, and of scarlet, and of fine twined linen shalt thou make it. Four square it shall be, and doubled. A span shall be the length thereof, and a span shall be the width of it. If you want to know what a span is, it is from one tip. If you hold your hand like this, from the tip here to the tip there. You say, what if you have big hands? Four square it shall be, and double the span shall be the length thereof, and the span shall be the width thereof. And thou shalt set it in, set in it settings of stones, even four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardis, and a topaz, and carbuncle, and this shall be the first row. And the second row shall be an emerald, and a sapphire, and a diamond. And the third row, a jacinth, and an agate, and an amethyst, which is my birthstone. And, and the fourth row, uh, a beryl, and onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold in their enclosings, and the stone shall be with the names, uh, get this, and the stone shall be with the names of the children of Israel, 12, according to their names, like the engravings of a signet. Every one with his name shall be according to the 12 tribes. And thou shalt make upon the breastplate chains at the end of the braid, work of pure gold, and thou shalt make upon the breastplate two rings of gold, and thou shalt put two rings on one end of the breastplate, and thou shalt put two, the two braided chains of gold in the two rings which are on the ends of the breastplate, and the other two ends of the two braided chains shalt thou fasten in their two settings and put them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod before it, and thou shalt make two rings of gold, and thou shalt put them upon the two ends of the breastplate and the border thereof, which is in the side of the ephod, Inward and two other rings of gold shalt thou make, and thou shalt put the two sides of the ephod underneath toward the fourth part thereof, over against the other couplings there, of above the beautifully woven girdle of the ephod. And they shall bind the breastplate by the rings thereof unto the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue, that it may be above beautifully woven girdle of the ephod, and that the breastplate not be loose from the ephod. So what is this all talking about? This is talking about the high priest garments, and it's primarily bringing out two particular things on this high priest garment. And that is, on his shoulders, there are six stones over here and six stones over here. And those stones represent the children of Israel. Okay, but not only that, but if you notice, the, the chain and everything is holding a breastplate in place right here in front and in back. And on the front are 12 stones that represent the 12 tribes of Israel also. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, so he bears us and he, he, he carries us and he bears the responsibility for us. 
But that's not the full picture. He's not just a boss. He's not just a manager. He's not just the guy that'll take responsibility for everything. On his heart is also the 12 stones, and that means he carries this not just on his shoulders of responsibility, but in his heart. And, and so there's, there's that beautiful picture of that, but if you'll notice, it's all very ordered, very, very clear, very, everything is very cut and dried, right? Okay? And you can depend on it day after day, year after year, century after century. This is the order. This is the pattern. Do it, and do it decently and in order. Okay, let's see. Let me make sure I've... Um, all right. Uh, <clears throat> All right, let's read, uh, I guess I didn't read uh, verse 29. Let's read that. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goeth in into the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. Okay, but let's read the next verse. Verse 30, And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and Thummim, and they... Uh, shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord, and Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. And uh, let's see, I'm just afraid here that I'm going to run out of time. Um, let's, how much time do we have? Oh, really? Okay. But I don't want to go super duper late here. So let's go to Numbers 27. <clears throat> Numbers, book of Numbers 27. And uh, verse 21, and that's going to be on page 205. <clears throat> Numbers 20, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's on 204. No, it's 205. Uh, and he shall stand before Eliezer the priest who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord at his word shall they go out and at his word shall they come in both he and all the children of Israel with him even all the congregation. And this is after Aaron is gone and uh, Joshua is succeeding him and uh, Eliezer the priest is succeeding Aaron and he's explaining the whole thing, but he's explaining this thing called Urim and, and Thummim. And um, let's see, uh, let me give you some facts I wrote down, facts about Urim and Thummim. It's placed in the breastplate. It means light, and it's not plural. It's not lights and perfections as most people translate it. It is light and completeness because the word perfection, like the, like the Bible would tell you to be perfect. Well, it's not telling, you can't be perfect, but you can be complete in him. You see. And the word perfect in the New Testament and in the Old Testament doesn't mean, you know, God says to Abraham, walk thou before me and be thou perfect, and then I, my covenant will be with you. Well, the covenant God made with Abraham was not after the law. So it couldn't possibly mean don't ever mess up. He meant come into the completion and our coming into this completion is oneness with Christ, okay? And that is completion. For, for why? Because Colossians 2 says, for you are complete in him. Okay? All right. Um, uh, all right. Let me find out where I'm at here. <clears throat> all right. So when, when the, the high priest went in, he had all this stuff ordered. God made this, what he wore and how he did everything, all of that was ordered. But there were times that they were in situations that the order wasn't clear. They didn't know. It was confusing to them. It was quantum world. It wasn't the natural world. You see what I'm saying? And so they, it seemed confusing to them, and they didn't know what to do. And so when that time came up, Urim and Thummim, came into play, okay? And what they would do, and, and you know, uh, there's different explanations, but they would consult the Lord through Urim and Thummim, and then they would get an answer. It doesn't tell you how it works and stuff like that. I mean, some people say, well, they light up and stuff. I didn't, I didn't find that, but, you know, it's, it's like red light, green light or something, you know what I mean? I, it, it doesn't say from what I could find. But somehow they found out in that specific place and time 
that it was confusing what to do that wasn't in principle or the, the principle wasn't clear or it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that. And so um, that involves something different than the order. You could go through the order of offering year after year and doing all this stuff and not even be in contact with God. You can be a Christian and go, go to church and give and do Sunday school work and, and sit in pews and even preach and stuff, and you can do that and not really be in contact with God because you're walking by principle. Do you understand what I'm saying? And, you, and it can actually be okay partially, except God is wanting more from us than that. He, he wants us to find his heart. He wants us to stay in touch with him. He wants us functioning as one. And Urim and Thummim make sure that we're on a level, the quantum level, we're on a level that we need him, not just his principles. Is that good? All right. Um, and then uh, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 33, since we've got still got a little bit of time here. Deuteronomy 33 and verse 8. And this was, uh, they were, uh, the prayers were going up by Moses for the different tribes. <clears throat> and uh, Deuteronomy 33 verse 8 is uh, the, the prayer to Levi, which Aaron the high priest was, and Moses were part of this tribe, and all the priests came from this tribe. Uh, Deuteronomy 33, verse 8, And of Levi, this is Moses' last words before he died, Let thy Thummim and thy Urim be with thy Holy One, whom thou didst test at Massa, and with whom thou didst strive at the waters of Meribah. And so here they were, they were at Massa, or Massa, however you pronounce that, and Meribah, and they strived with God and with the leadership, and they didn't know the answer and stuff, and he says, look, let thy Urim and Thummim be with them. Let them, when they don't know, they don't, the order isn't clear, they don't have the right principle or they don't know if they do or not, get in touch with God. Get, be a son. Be part of the family. Find his heart. Function as one. Yes. You see? And there are many unknown areas, folks, that we have to stay in touch with the Lord. <clears throat> um, I know... Uh, I was telling somebody about this recently, but uh, years ago, um, our church was doing real well. We had, not, you know, a lot of lot of facilities. I guess we didn't have as much as we do now, but but it, we had a lot to do stuff in, and and um, we had quite a few young people. <clears throat> And somebody came to me, and well, actually, people started saying, "Well, we need a youth group. We need a youth group." <clears throat> and I remember we were praying. We're going, man, I just don't feel like we got, you know, the person that God wants to lead us into this as a youth group leader, that, that I don't sense that person given of God. And we know what it's like to find the right person for the right job. I mean, uh, <clears throat> when we ran the, the shelter and uh, what was our boy's name? George. Perfect for the job. Perfect, you know. We, and, and we've always tried to find God's person, not just do something. So the longer we went without assigning somebody to be a youth group leader and do it all, uh, people started getting upset with me. Well, why don't we do this? We need a youth group. Everybody else got a youth group. Um, and, uh, and then people say, well, if you don't get a youth group, then we're going to leave. We're going to go to another church that has a youth group. Okay. I said, well, you know, I really don't have any say in this. <laughs> you know, but see, people think that, you know, since I'm the pastor, that I'm the one directing everything. I'm not. I, I don't really have much say at all. I'm just trying to hear from him. I mean, that's really how I live. Amen. You know, I don't have it together. I have him. Amen. Okay. Anyway, somebody came to me, and they said, look, I know how to do this. I know what to do. I know how to run a youth group. And I just went, that, you know, that, they are not the right person. I mean, I could tell that it wasn't, it was more flesh, and it was more, I can do this, and I was going, I don't know. Uh, um, and, and my thought was, I am not looking to get a job done. I'm looking that the father would get his son. That almost rhymes. Huh? Write that down, make a song. 
I'm kidding. Um, but, but you see, I'm going to stand before God as to whether this church gave the father his son, not how good our youth group was. Am I right or wrong? And, and I see, you're not. I am. I'm the one that must give an account. I'm the one. And so it's a big deal to me. And, okay, well, let's void out that this time, Randy. That's, that, that Jesus thing is not as important as having a youth group. That's what people say to me. I can't void out Jesus. I can't void out the primary thing upon which all everything else is built, the core, the central thing. I can't void that out so that, well, then people started leaving the church. Well, we'll go to a church where there's a good youth group. I thought, man, you know, if it's really that easy to, 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 to get them out of here, then you probably need to go. I mean, that's what I thought. Because I will not, not in my being, will I, I compromise the father getting his son. I see, it's, it's a, here's the deal. Here's the way I look at it. Okay? It's a whole lot easier to not do anything when God hasn't, get, you know, Urim and Thummim hadn't told you what to do. It's a whole lot easier just not to do anything and clean up the mess of that than to put somebody in there that, does, that isn't going to bring forth Christ and that is not appointed of God and then clean up the mess. That, 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 you talk about work. That's work. Remember that as pastor and leader and whatever. Remember that because, you know, we're always, oh, well, we'll, we'll make the people happy. What are you, Saul? Are you King Saul? He did everything to make people happy. David did what was the Lord and what would glorify the Lord at, at tremendous expense and cost. But hey, no expense at all, no cost at all. What are we giving up, carnal Christians that don't want the father to get his son? I want my program. And, you know, throw in a fit and you go, oh, please stay. No. <laughs> no, not oh, please stay. Feel free to go. We'll pray for you. In fact, let me recommend a couple of churches that really need people like you. There's the church of Satan over here. No, I'm, I'm teasing. I'm only joking. I'm only joking. All right. So, um, let's see. Uh, let's go to one more scripture and then, then I'll end. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 28. 1 Samuel 28, and we're getting, uh, it's going to be verse 6, so that's uh, 354, if you, if you want to turn. This is the last scripture. <clears throat> 1 Samuel 28, verse 6. All right. This is, this is King Saul, okay? And King Saul is going to go to Urim and Thummim, which is a good thing, right? All right. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams nor by Urim nor by prophets. So, so uh, you know, the scripture says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And the actual translation is, they that wait upon the Lord shall change strength. Okay. So, uh, Waiting on the Lord instead of just doing something is the answer. Wait till it's Christ. That's what you're waiting for. Whether if you're a leader and a pastor or overseeing a bunch of people, wait until it's Christ coming forth. Don't just do something so something's happening. So people go, well, we got to do something. We are. I've said that last class or the beginning of this. We are doing something. We're waiting on the Lord. That is doing something. And uh, so, and in some cases, it's not just what you do, but what you don't do. Yes. That, you know, I'm letting this be Jesus by not doing something that's not Jesus. <laughs> Does that make sense? I would rather nothing happen. I'd rather it fall apart if God's not going to answer me. And God didn't answer Saul, but there's this itchy, oh, we got to do something. We got to do something. We got to start something. We got to please the people. Everybody will leave. Well, my God, where is the goal? 
that everybody stay here. I mean, I told you about the guy who said to me, you know, numbers is important, you know. I said, you know, I'm not interested in quantity, I'm interested in quality. He said, numbers is important. If you, there's a whole book named after it. And I said, have you ever read the book of numbers? It's all about God cutting people away. That the whole book is about that. I mean, they start with this big number and they end up, you know, it's not what you think, buddy. <clears throat> anyway, First um, Samuel 28, verse 6, And Saul inquired of the Lord. The Lord answered him, Not neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Next verse. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said unto him, Behold, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor, or what is the word in your Bible? Um, hath a familiar spirit. Okay. Basically, she's called the witch of Endor. Let me, let, me, let me say something. Let me end with something. If your goal is just to get an answer, when you don't hear something from God and you need an answer because the answer is what you need, not the Lord, you're liable to resort all the way to a witch. If you're him and thumbing, you, you, you know, he's not, you know, and again, just because he's not taught, you know. I mean, I remember one time somebody said to me, said, uh, uh, I asked the Lord if he would do so and so, and he didn't answer. And I said, he did answer. He said, no. <laughs> but my point being, a lot of times he's talking and we're not hearing, but even if he's not giving you an answer, the answer is, wait, this may not be the right timing, the right person is not here, da-da-da-da, there's so many factors. Be with me, Urim as be with me. And that, that Urim and Thummim was put right there with the breastplate on his heart. It was a heart thing, not a shoulder thing, not a principle thing. You know, Lord, the principle of your nature is to lay down your life. But what do you want me to do? I've had to do that. I've had to do that in situations. And the Lord said, and this is this, you know, I, the Lord said to me at those times, stand up and fight for the church. You remember when they were going to shut off all parking over here when we were on Maple and, and everything? And the Lord said, do not lay down your life. I want you to go down there with signs and everything to City Hall and show up in the City Hall meeting. And I want you to go door to door and get lists of people signing that we don't want to take away all of our parking because we had no parking other than street parking. And we got, what, 5,000 signatures. And the city caught wind of it and they just called the whole thing off. But what if I'd have just said, well, I guess we'll just lay down our life. And, and it's okay. The principle is okay. But we need to be checking with the Lord. Amen. That's right. it, because it's about being a son to the Father. It's about a relationship. It's not about doing. It's not about, a, a, you know. And, and here's the thing about this scripture right here. This is the last mention of Urim and Thummim. The last mention in the Bible. After that, no priest asked those kind of questions. They all just went with the principle of the thing, the order. This is the way it's always been ordered. Nobody got to his heart. Nobody checked in. And Saul abused it because he was just looking for answers. He wasn't trying to hear from God. He's just looking for answers. And because of that, if I don't get it from God, I'll go to a witch. You know? So, it's a bad note to end on, but it's a good note. Let it put the fear of God in us, folks. We're leaders. We're, we're people that are responsible to the Lord. We're not just responsible for lives. We say we're responsible for life, so we need to start this youth group thing, and we need to get going great guns right now. And the Lord is saying, no, it's not my person. It's not my timing. And he can do more without that. But we don't believe that. It's got to be a program. It's got to be a specific kind of program like all other churches have. Everything's got to look like classical religion, classical physics. No, sir. No, ma'am. Everything's got to look like Jesus. <laughs> from the heart, we must say these things, not from the shoulders. From the heart, this stuff has to come. 
Father, we ask you to break down our religious concepts and build in us the reality of the sun so that, so that the quantum world doesn't look chaotic. It, it, we see the order of it. The order, you have an order, and we get with you, and then we see how it works out. You don't explain order there. You just be you, and we follow you. We're not going somewhere when we're following you. We're just following you. We may end up many places, but in our heart, we're not trying to go somewhere. We're just trying to follow you, and you'll lead us where we need to go. We love you. We're with you. We, our hearts are with you. We're sold out, and we want to be sold out more. Do it in us and break down these things because, Father, if they don't get broken in us, we'll be affecting your kingdom and your people in negative ways, not even knowing it, thinking we're doing the right thing when it may be right, but it's wrong because it's not Christ. Help us to see by your spirit and help us to follow and obey by your heart and your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Where did